I'm going to try and start things off by asking a couple of questions and making a few comments um, and asking the panel to respond and then we'll obviously open up the discussion to, to all of you. And again, can people come up to use the microphone um, when they ask questions, please? That would be great. Okay. So I have, I think, two strands that I'd like to throw out there and, and if the, the speakers would like to respond to either one of them, that would be great. One is something that emerged from a conversation with, with Kristen and Sarah during, during the break, uh, which is that one of the threads running through the papers that we've heard today seems to concern the role of the affective, and in particular the role of the affective in uh, the, the question of the relation between human and non-human life. Um, and I think there is so much more uh, to say on that that I'll, I'll just leave it at that, and I sort of would like us to perhaps go back to that question of the affective and its role, particularly in bridging human and non-human life or forging shared lives across human and, and, and non-human. The other thing I'd like to just go back to is actually Brooke's question from yesterday, in, in the plenary yesterday, where she raised the question of whether it's possible to find, uh, uh, to, to reclaim a notion of bios that is in some way opens up the possibility of an affirmative notion of the political, that pulls it away from the model of the biopolitical as a, a mode of um, subjection. And with that in mind, it was really, um, not just with that in mind, but, but with that in mind in particular, it was wonderful to hear Sarah's rendering of Bios and Zoe this morning and uh, the way in which you pulled that away from um, what you incredibly <coughs> convincingly argued as a Gambon's very reductive reading of Zoe as bare life and instead opened up this way of thinking shared life uh, as a kind of nexus between Bios and Zoe and between matter and meaning in an incredibly rich way. And that took me back to Kristen's comments yesterday, those of you who are here, who, when we were discussing these issues, Kristen uh, said that we need not only to pay attention to the fragility of life as bios, but also we need to pay attention to the fragility of the earth, to the fragility of climate. So, which takes me to the question about um, how we might think in ways that not only take us perhaps beyond Bios or even beyond the intertwining of Bios and Zoe, but towards also the question of the relationship between organic and inorganic um, materialities. Various people here have referenced Jane Bennett in, in her book. Um, in some ways, she replaces the concept of life, I think, with this concept of vital matter. And she has a, a wonderful chapter on the vital life of metals, which is, if you haven't read it, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. So she has this incredibly encompassing notion of life, which encompasses all the way through the inorganic. So I guess my, my, my question, and, and thinking about Brooke's comments today on how sympathy, whilst it became enmeshed in images of the organic through and through, nonetheless, you sort of retrieved a notion of sympathy in which the stone was as much a part of the, the sympathetic as the sage, as you said. So there's a, there's a sort of a way of thinking sympathy that encompasses, again, both organic and inorganic. So I guess that the question I have then is about the place of, perhaps not just the place of the inorganic, but the place of the enmeshment, to borrow your word, Brooke, the, in, the enmeshment of the organic and the inorganic in the different approaches that each of you are opening up to life, matter, nature. And, and it does seem particularly pressing, given Kristen's comments yesterday about the fragility of Earth, the fragility of climate, and given that the backdrop to many of your papers was explicitly an attempt to engage with contemporary debates around life, the political and the ecological, this question of the enmeshment of the organic and the inorganic seems pressing in, in, in a number of ways. So I guess th those two lines would be ones that I would be really interested in hearing more about, the, the role of the effective in bridging human and non-human life, and the place of the enmeshment of the organic and the inorganic in the different ways in which you are thinking about life and matter and nature. So I could just throw out a comment maybe to get us going. Oh, sorry. I could throw out a comment just to get us going or a passage uh, 
that might uh, help spark discussion. So uh, there's this very interesting, uh, very small argument in parts of animals about uh, why plants don't have don't give up a waste product. And uh, Aristotle's argument there is that the reason why they don't give up a waste product is because their food is concocted by the warmth of the earth that surrounds them. And he says specifically that the, the, the earth serves and its warmth serves as a kind of external stomach. So, so I thought that that idea of, of a kind of the externality of organs or the extension of organicity beyond the contours of the body of the organism is a, a really rich and interesting way to think about you know, what, what we would call the relationship between a thing and its environment. But, but this idea of, of the earth ask, acting as kind of a prosthetic stomach, I think is, is really fascinating and sort of challenges us I think to, to wonder if, about what Aristotle means by organicity. Uh, uh, I, so, so what he's identifying as a kind of functional totality, a, like an accomplishment of the nourishment of the plant, but that is deeply embedded not in the plant's parts, but in its relationship to, to, to the earth that, in which it finds itself. So, so that might be sort of one, one entree into thinking about that question of the organic and the inorganic. Gives me a chance to ask you the question that, that I wanted to ask you this morning, which is, um, you know, I mean, what do you think are the sort of enabling or limiting conditions of sort of shared life or, or living with, right, for, for Aristotle? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would it mean for him, or, you know, to, to say that we, you know that we could have a shared, a shared life with, with plants. I mean, you know, I mean, we, you know, I mean, I'm coming at this from sort of, you know, from animal studies, and and, um, you know, one of the things that I've thought about is, you know, that kind of, you know, the sort of foundational, I mean, one of the foundational um, texts for ecology, you know, um, Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain, where, you know, I mean, he, I mean, it, it sort of, you think it's about this, you know, you think it's about the dying wolf, but he kind of I mean, he leaps over that immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't stay there. He says, you know, what is it like to sort of think like a mountain? I mean, that that's that's the that's the thought that that experience yeah. enables. So I just yeah. I'm just curious what you would you know yeah. what you would say about that. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, I, I so I was trying to argue that that you know this notion of shared affect really is this undergirding current that makes possible the sharing of life like to the extent that we are capable of feeling attached to one another mm -hmm. we are capable of of the desire of sharing our lives with one another but often for for aristotle that comes out as a limit point right it's precisely our limited capacity to do so that limits the size of our our, our community of friends mm -hmm. so so but but i think thinking in in a on a broader scale, what that tells me is that, that what, what Aristotle is saying is that uh, an enhancement to our capacity to, to feel attachment would be a radical form of transformation of human community. So, so to the extent that we could imagine not simply sort of prosthetic organs, but, but, but prosthetic affect, uh, the, the, the capacity to, to feel as and for in a, 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 a non-human context, I think is really interesting. And, and so, so contemporary work on, on the, the animal sensorium, you know, on the, the structure of, of, of the fly eye or something along those lines like, that gives us access to, to the perceptive life of non-human animals uh, uh, also opens up this, this possibility for ways in which we could come to, to have this sort of effective attachment beyond the realm of the human. Yeah. That I, that I think is, is interesting. Um, this isn't exactly to that, but I think it's on the same line, but just to go back to the questions um, that Rachel raised and that we were speaking about yesterday. Um, in terms of not just, you know, an affirmative biopolitics, but, you know, the conversation, um, Miriam's thinking about um, extending the kind of critique of immortalist humanism and thinking about natality, and I think the kind of other side of that is um, thinking this kind of notion of the fragility of the earth is, you know, is a kind of an analog to mortalist humanism and, and, you know, what is the sort of form of natality, but also sort of what's the form of the both and there. So I've been thinking a lot about this question of the both and, and 
And on this notion of, of you know, sympathy with these vertical and, and horizontal axes, and it was nice in John's paper how those, that kind of, you know, um, uh, those, those vectors returned. Um, but, you know, I think part of the point was to say we can't sort of opt out of one. I mean, we can't just choose one over the other, but I think we can rethink what those axes are. And if the horizontal is the kind of the commonality in the sense that there's a continuum and there's a sense of, of shared forms of, say, semiosis that cross species boundaries or taxonomic boundaries or what, you know, the, the vertical, rather than being seen in terms of a hierarchy and an, an extreme hierarchy of the stoic cosmos that goes up to this kind of immaterial mind, might actually be thought rather as the vector of difference and what is the specificity of difference because I think sometimes as we move into this notion of organicity and that we are all one and the human and the non-human but of course and in Bennett's book I think she takes this up in the second to the last chapter that the question of a politics will have to take into account a specificity of the human and that that itself is given by an ecological viewpoint that if we imagine that somehow all is all the same we are you know it's, it's like Donna Haraway says in the God trick I mean in the situated knowledges I mean that relativism is just another form of, of hyper objectivity so that we also have to take on board and have responsibility to the kind of specific form of human being and, and what that means for our possibilities of engagement with the non-human which is not to say you know, it's interesting we talk in terms of limits. I mean, here I think the Spinoza line, you know, we don't know the limits of a body, but, you know, it's not to say there are no limits, yeah. but we just don't, we can't predict them in advance. But that, that doesn't mean there aren't contours of, of um, operability and, and thinkability that might themselves change, that might, you know, be, be mobile, but are nevertheless not just open, open freedom. And so I think for me, one of the questions that that opens up is to think about um, how the, you know, people have been very interested in, in work in evolutionary biology and thinking about, you know, really biology all the way down to physics or chemistry and the, you know, life of the earth and that there's so many resources there for thinking about how we end up in these relations that does not require the fallback on a notion of transcendent nature, capital N, the way that it did, you know, it, it, maybe it never required, I mean, Lucretius, Epicureanism, you know, we can have this other conversation, but that move is less conditioned uh, the more we have conceptual resources to think about how organisms are embedded in relations of interdependence that are themselves emergent and contingent and incredibly mindful because of the self-organizing capacities of, of matter. So on the one hand, you have this notion of of evolutionary and kind of givenness to the relationality that we have. But then the other side, you know, to go back, what is the specificity of the human? What is the specificity? And particularly, I think, you know, in Aristotle's notion where the political really does seem to be a kind of human enterprise, that living together really is a human enterprise. And that there the question becomes, so what, what kinds of choices? Mm -hmm. What kinds of decisions and cuts do we make in, you know, trying to take what's given in our relationality to the world and what's kind of um, specific to our being in the world as biological beings and how do we turn that into a kind of um, mindful way of being with other natures? Um, that to me is the kind of question to hold those two things together at the same time, to think both a kind of post-humanism that has a place for agential post-humanism or a kind of creative, um, care, you know, uh, ethical kind of post-humanism and the other side, which t looks to the continuum, which looks to the fact that we are, um, you know, given by my, you know, our microbiome and, and processes that far outdate us and germ cells and all of the rest, that holding those two things together. And that's where I think the Greeks are really productive because they are always, in a way, thinking the human, that, you know, that, that's the way in which humanism never, I think we never post human, like uh, the, the sort of utopian fantasy that we would sort of stop thinking the human seems to deny, um, this seems to be a sort of irresponsible denial of something. And so, yes, you know, the Stoics are crazy anthropocentrists, but they're also thinking radical, I mean, such weird things that when they were, you know, you get the reception of Stoicism in the 17th century, they're like, whoa, these guys are wacky. We want the Platonists back, you know? I mean, <laughs> so that's the challenge. And I think that's why antiquity has something to help us think through that challenge. Because it's one thing, this is the last thing I'll say, but I mean, it's one thing to say, 
okay, let's stop thinking mind-body dualism. Let's think the non-human. Like, let's, you know, it's a kind of imperative. Um, it, it becomes an ethical imperative. It becomes something that everybody is saying we should do. But actually, the hard work is doing it. The hard work is inhabiting that space because so many of our categories, are, we have them because they're easy. And that to sort of create that space that's a both and is very difficult and that the Greeks, we need that distance and difference in order to sort of just hold that space open so that we can expand there. Um, Emma and John, do either of you want to come in, intervene, change the course of the conversation? Um, yeah, I, I, I must say that, yeah, in terms of, I just want to really be clear that uh, um, I, uh, uh, I do think that there's certain kind of uh, resources, that, resources, you know, it makes it sound so utilitarian, but um, um, there are certain ways in which, you know, the ancient, ancient philosophy, antiquity speaks to us in, in, in ways that allow us to sort of enrich our sense of our place and our enmeshment in the world. And I think all of these papers have, have, shown, have shown that. And I also just want to be incredibly sort of skeptical about the possibility that something like Aristotle's politics could be... Uh, 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 some, a model for our politics, because I don't think there's any way that it's conceivable within Aristotle's notion of the political as such that there could be, you know, these sorts of um, wholesale reorientations uh, of the political as such. You know, the personal is political, for example. This is unthinkable for Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, 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 the idea that, you know, the idea of an environmental politics is unthinkable for Aristotle mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, w how he delineates the political as mm -hmm. such. So I think, you know, we, ha we have to be uh, uh, careful about the ways that, you know, and I do think it's actually at the, at the, at the, um, at, at, in the dimension of the ethical that the, there's a, a much richer um, kind of, uh, 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 engagement is possible because uh, we, there, I think there is a way that we are enjoined in Aristotelian thinking to, you know, take responsibility for the decisions that we make um, and to be aware that at each and every moment we make decisions that contribute to um, um, our, our own Bildung, say, but also, you know, we can easily stretch that out to the 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 the, the way that the way that we live together. Um, but I, I I guess I had a question for Mark, which is that you know the, about the denotation of this notion of the choric that you're using, mm -hmm. because um, you know I'm hearing in it the chorus, yeah. um, which is I think the sense from which you're you're use, using it. But at the same time, you're invoking this notion of an errancy, which seems to be. Uh, uh, a going off track into something that would be unnatural, mm -hmm. but and, but I, I also just want to hear in that the the errant the 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 core, the core. as yeah, no, as no. errant cause and yeah. just I just you know and also as as a, as a, as a as a realm that again is resist resists um, our um, our uh, uh, our projections right yeah um, I mean that, that I yeah. Mean, yeah I mean I'm absolutely trying to sort of I mean, or, or I am using the term in a way that, I mean, is, is sort of undecided, right, between Koros and Kora, right? Mm. Um, because, I mean, precisely, I mean, what I, I want to do is, you know, to kind of sort of hold open the kind of sort of maximum possibility for kind of, you know, interpolation, I mean, sort of invocation from the, from the outside, right? Um, and you know, to sort of in, you know, in, instead of instead of us, I mean, think, you know, thinking that we can do the thinking, right, of the post-human, you know, right, our sort of thinking of that project of of, of sort of thinking the post-human as, as as being something that that that, that we pro kind of project. You know, by which we project ourselves outward, mm -hmm. right? To sort of, you know, hold up, allow, I mean, to use your word, I mean, take the resources of the Greeks and, you know, and, and see what they give us in terms of a sort of maximal possibilities for thinking about, you know, the, the, um, 
you know, about externality and, and the place of externality in our, in our formation. Um, because um, there is a lot there, I think. And it, you know, it may not be in, may not necessarily be in Aristotle, Um, well, I, I would want to uh, offer Evan Thompson's uh, 2007 book, Mind and Life, as a resource for us to think about. So he's trying to get away from, uh, he was the collaborator with uh, Francisco Varela in the, in the 1991 book, Embodied Mind. And um, so his own book is uh, from Harvard, 2007. And so in breaking away from a Cartesian mind-body uh, dualism, he says, well, if we look at what single cell bacteria do, they are able to sense gradients or differences in their environment. Those things have a significance for them, for the, um, for the organism relative to their needs, and then they can orient themselves in the environment relative to whether they're sensing food or poison, basically. So he calls that sense making. Right? And so this is um, offers a way. So in my reading of that book, I, I talked about that as a biological panpsychism, but he stops at the level of the uh, organism. He won't go below. So I pointed out to him that um, Gregory Bateson and some of the uh, cyberneticists would want to see mind whenever they're self-organizing behaviors, even in the inorganic. So, but Thompson holds the line with uh, organisms. So there's a, a, a rich field there, and I'm not sure how to connect this to, uh, to the Greeks, but uh, in terms of the, where the psyche stops, uh, Thompson holds the line with uh, organisms and does not go to a full-blown panpsychism. But I guess what I would want to ask you, Brooke, is whether the, could we talk about the Stoics as having not a panpsychism, but a hen psychism? There's just one soul. It's not that everything has souls. It's that altogether the world has a soul or is a soul. I mean, could you pick up on that? that yeah, I mean, things? I think, <laughs> not to sound repetitive, but I think here it's, it's, it's the both and again. It's yes, there's one mind, there's the active principle, there's God, nature, reason. I mean, there's this way in which the, what you're describing as a kind of hen psychism is a, you know, is, a, is a really pervasive reductionism that we can call the active principle all these things, but it's really just one. But on the other hand, the fact that mind is differentially distributed throughout the world is really crucial, and that is not just the space of a hierarchy, but to go back to you know some of the stuff that Rebecca's working with, really is a space for thinking difference per se, that that difference is, is tangible and real, so that Foucault's critique in, you know, in, in Les Moyes Les Shows about you know, sympathy you know, in the early modern period, that if there was no antipathy, everything would collapse in on itself, and that's sometimes repeated. And I think that's wrong. It's wrong because the Stoic notion of sympathy presumes a real plurality of differential distribution of mind that is, it, it's not just all the same. I mean, whatever the kingdom of resemblances is, you know, by the time you get to the 17th century, and I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious of Foucault's reading there, but um, whatever it is, it's not sameness. And so somehow we have to kind of account for that. And I think, but I think it's, you know, it makes it sound like it's sort of, you know, oh, it's both and. It's, you know, it's the one and it's the many. Um, but, if, you know, of course the one and the many is always a problem. And I think, but where it comes out for the Stoics is what does it mean for mind to be imminent in a plant that, you know, shouldn't have so much sort of organization, you know, so the challenge to the plant, I mean, Galen takes this up in really interesting ways because it has this kind of, you know, does it have sensation or is it just an automaton? But the same problems come up obviously for the human, that, you know, is the human just an automaton or is the human have some fold that, that, that different, does that difference have consequences for our own difference as a kind of singularity of a life or the singularity even of a species? So that that problem to me is, is if not, if we don't have enough of the Stoics to see quite how it's worked out, although I think that the idea of oikiosis is one way of dealing with that, certainly the problem of Stoic determinism was a, it's a huge provocation in antiquity about, if not the modern will, certainly the question of what a difference within a one might look like. Mm 
So when I hear that, I'm, I think of, of a, a sort of Leibnizian idea where there's some really dark and confused monads, and you know the, the universe is impinging on all the monads, but some of them just have really small uh, areas of clarity, and then others have much larger. So is that resonating with how you're reading the Stoics? Yeah, I, I think it's resonating with just, you know, I think it would be pretty uncontroversial that that reflects this, again, this notion of, of a hierarchy of, of bodies. But again, that I, I do think where you can sort of, where we can push back is to say that, that, hi, that you can, well, it's hard, right? Because we still, even in, even in you know, I'm sure this book, you know, it's still about complexity. And complexity is another way of thinking about hierarchy. And we can try, you know, we can try to parse it in terms of difference, but it's hard not to make complexity a value term. Um, and so, you know, it's hard, you know, I'm suggesting in a kind of utopian way, maybe we can reread the vertical axis in terms of pure difference. But of course, the minute you start talking about organisms and the question of complexity will come back into the picture. Yeah, the, um, uh so-called inactive position, which is the Varela and Thompson and another guy named Ezekiel de Paolo. They're always talking about the necessity of a membrane and a metabolism and the recursivity of the membrane and the metabolism. So the membrane creates the space within which the metabolism, instead of being dispersed, is able to work on itself. Uh, but it's the metabolism that produces the membrane in the first place, because one of the tasks of a metabolism. So that's, that's why uh, Thompson is going to draw the line. So there's a minimal complexity that something like an autocatalytic loop, a chemical loop, is not going to have because it's not going to have this sort of spatial construction, this membrane construction. So I think there's a lot of... Uh, uh, very interesting things. I mean, because Thompson doesn't deny self-organizing processes in nature. He just says that only some of them should be talked about in terms of cognition. Yeah. Uh, and so, but then, you know, this, so that's what I, in this article I wrote on the, on the book, I tried to push him, isn't this a kind of an arbitrary uh, why? Why don't you go all the way? Become a panpsychist. Well, and I think that sort of the implication of that goes back to what I was saying. At some point, you know, our relations with the non-human, relations between non-human beings are sort of given. I mean, you know, you, there's a way in which we're less skeptical about science. We think biology can tell us something, and we, we take that on board to say we're not just making this up, that some, you know, organisms have membranes and some don't. But the choice about how to, you know, sort of metabolize that conceptually is a political one. And so these conversations about, you know, do we call plant minds, you know, cognition, do we call it mind? I mean, that's a choice, it's our choice. It's not given to us by the gradations, you know, in nature as it were. So there is a kind of, it's not nature society in the kind of old split, but there is a kind of repetition of a, again, a kind of fold whereby we negotiate a givenness, and that negotiation is always political. I think there are some people who have questions from the audience, if we could open up. Um, Rebecca, do you want to start us off? Yes, this is really following on from what's being discussed. Oops. Right now. Um, Liz Gross has a, a recent essay in uh, Parisia uh, on the work of uh, Deleuze and uh, Raymond Rear. And uh, Rear's work uh, talks about, uh, this isn't actually, oh, he, took, he distinguishes between relations of, he calls them liaison, and relations uh, between what he calls aggregates. And relations of liaison are, this is, I'm gonna put it in Aristotelian terms, are relations of continuity between parts mm -hmm. that make, um, for the want of a better term, holes. So he talks about this idea of embryogenesis. So for example, an atom, um, for him, an atom is a structuring activity. Mm -hmm. so for him, the distinction between, let's say, the structuring activity of an atom and uh, the structuring activity, he uses this, he also talks about an idea of primary consciousness. He will also, he will use this idea of primary consciousness to talk about, for example, the human brain or the, the embryogenesis of an egg. For him, the distinction isn't so much between um, the organic and the inorganic, but between relations of kind of, 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 kind of continuity of relations between 
sort of parts growing into parts mm -hmm. and uh, relations between aggregates. Uh, the relation between aggregates would be, I don't know, like the relationship between um, tiles on the floor um, placed next to each other, which are relations of contiguity. I don't know if I can get that into a question. Uh, I think I might just stop it there. I must say, by the way, it's a great conference and um, very, very stimulating, and thank you. And I'm going to shut up. <laughs> talking too much, but um, one of the people that we haven't yet talked about, but who's behind uh, Bennett and Bill Connolly is uh, Whitehead, so the people have been reading, they, they've been reading Whitehead a lot on the philosophy of organism, mm -hmm. and um, so there might be a possible connection there. I don't know the, the Houllier as well, uh, but he has this notion of uh, survol, survol, it's kind of overflight. Um, but the... Um, um, it, it, there's a classic problem in panpsychism about whether the, if you take a sort of Leibnizian or monadic uh, or I think even Whiteheadian uh, notion, you can say that, well, all of the little monads of this bottle are reflecting the universe, but the bottle itself only reflects its dominant monad. So there's a difference between the table um, it would just be an aggregate. So the table wouldn't be conscious or sentience or, or anything like that, but although all of its little particles would be. But for me, because there's a dominant monad, right, all the little particles are both themselves reflective of the universe and me as a whole reflects the universe. So that's a kind of Leibnizio, Whiteheadian take on that question of the aggregate versus the, the unity. Um, but. I don't know, uh, I know Bill Conley works now with Whitehead a lot, and I think Jane Bennett probably in the background of Vibrant Matter probably has, is that the book? Vibrant Matter, yeah? That might have something there. And Bergson as well. So there's a whole field of sources that from why are some of the new materialists are getting some of those ideas. But that's definitely a question, the aggregate versus the unity. Great. Uh, thank you all for your uh, papers and uh, responses. So I think my question's uh, uh, quite straightforward, and I can envision maybe more methodological responses to it, or ones kind of uh, more topically based, particularly in, in uh, ancient sources and such. And it's just about kind of the, the source of the value of life. Um, and I think this is kind of a, a question that floats in the background of, of you know, a lot of the work in this area, which is, it's almost taken for granted. We do value life. I think you know, many of us, we find ourselves valuing it for whatever reason. Um, but to articulate why that is and, um, seems to be more difficult. And, and in particular, I have in the back of my mind a paper at uh, the, Philosophia, the Philosophia Conference in, in May. I know Rachel and Emma were there and maybe others and stuff. And the, the, yeah, so Claire Colbrook's uh, keynote um, in her paper, or you know, she, so she defended you know a, a pretty contentious claim, which is just that you know there's no prima facie reason for valuing life, and she's I think developed that pretty extensively under the trope of a of an ethics of extinction and such. So um, I don't know if any of you would want to kind of take on that topic, how it informs your work, or where turning to the ancients might kind of inform that particular debate. Thanks. I'm really for it, and, and I'm really, I'm, the reason I'm for it is because it's given to us. I mean, does that sound, it's not theological, it's, uh, it, it, maybe it's uh, sort of Heideggerian in a, in a sense, um, but in a, in, a, in a rigorously non-theological non, non mode, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's just there, I and mean, we're in it. And uh, this is what we have. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't go beyond that. It's, I, I, I wish that I was uh, more articulate about it. I'm not sure there's, there is, there's much more to say than that. We're, we're thrown into it, and it's, uh, and it's there for us to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I would say, for, I mean, for me, I mean, um, you know, the one, I mean, the philosopher that I've taught most is, is Plotinus, and I mean, that, mm -hmm. for Plotinus, that is, that is the, in a way, I mean, it's the question. I mean, how to, 
think the source of life, how to think the source of being as something that is itself other than life, other than being, right? So it's so sort of to, to really, I mean, how do we, can we, should we disengage ourselves from that sort of imminent, I mean, that, that sort of valuing of life that we have by virtue of our own sort of being in life? I think, I mean, that, that's, that's his question. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the place for me where it's really, um, you know, sort of front and center as, as the kind of ultimate threshold of the sort of platonic, or, you know, sort of neo-platonic, mm. platinian philosophical project. I mean, we just say I think that's given in a, in a lot of ancient philosophy. I mean, certainly in Epicureanism and trying to think of, you know, Jim Porter's not here, but I mean, this notion of love of life um, or um, the way in which the organism is just put forth in Plato is obviously the world is going to be a zoan because obviously life is the most valuable thing. It's both a kind of, you know, a reason to think the givenness. Um, you know, it's an opportunity to sort of self-examine it, but um, yeah. I'm with Emma. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said, uh, but maybe um, to add a, a twist to the question that I think would get to a question I was hoping to ask Emma also, uh, 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 to shift gears a little bit from, from that of life to, to the question of nature, uh, and, and specifically the relationship between fusis and fue, right, growth, mm. right? Uh, so, so it seems like one of these places where we, we see life emergent as meaningful is, is in the noticeable cycles of maturation. Uh, so, so that the, there, there is this, this sense of a, a cycle of life whereby different, different morphological features become evident in, in, a, in a pattern uh, that, that is hard to ignore and that, that spans across species. Uh, and, and so the, the question for Emma that I have relates to the way that ta automata kind of challenges fusis in, in, in the, the places where ta automata is featured as the things of the earth coming forth spontaneously, so specifically in the, in the statesman. Uh, but I think you also mentioned, uh, uh, oh, in, in Hesiod's Golden Age as well. And, and there it seems as though uh, part of what's, what's threatening to fusis about ta automata is that it also has a model of growth, uh, but a model of growth that's not maturation but mutation or something like that. And so it, so it might be interesting to draw out that that is a potential tension uh, in the notion of, of ta automata and, and in, in explaining to us why ta automata might, might compete with nature or threaten nature or be somehow unnatural. So I'm wondering just what you... Yeah, I, I think it really only becomes uh, um, um, a point of, of agonism or tension in in relation to Aristotelian teleology, mm -hmm. um, where tele where where nature takes the name of teleology, mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's where that that um, that agonism arises. But you know, yes, of course, you can say that, um, and and I think this is the sense of uh, automaton in its more arch archaic mode that it is simply a burgeoning, mm -hmm. a, 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 a burgeoning, and a, and that can be that can have a that can be the burgeoning of disease. And the burgeoning of fruit, yeah. right? So it, it's 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 got this uh, 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 absolutely neutral or, or ambivalent valence, yeah. um, and I think that's always the case with life. And I think that's what, in fact why oh, I'm going to sound so sort of weirdly traditional, but I think that's why we are we have this uh, 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 responsibility for a, a certain kinds of st stewardship. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, it's it's up to us to uh, 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 shape, um, nurture, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, selectively um, um, engage with nature in certain kinds of ways that can also that can be violent and also uh, uh, um, um, productive. Uh, 
um, but, all, but, but mostly to listen, right? I mean, I think, you know, when there's, you know, the hurricanes and the forest fires and the this and the that, I mean, those are just, you know, the oracle at Delphi, you know, neither conceals nor reveals, <laughs> but gives a sign. I mean, I think, you know, we read those, those are there to be read mm. and acted upon. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's sort of our job, mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I guess, didn't Nietzsche tell us about the tragic wisdom of the Greeks? The better never to have been born, but second best is to die young. So I, I think that's where Claire might be picking up something. Okay, we have uh, one last question, and then we'll, we'll move. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question for Brooke, and a question, um, uh, perhaps for, for the entire panel, uh, centered on, on Aristotle. L the question for, for Brooke is the following, how about the skin of the Stoic sage? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, how about that liminal surface between the cosmos and myself if I'm a a sage, um, because I, I think of uh, Seneca in the De Ira, uh, the ideal of being durus, the idea, the ideal of being someone uh, who is not affected precisely, who rejects the, the arrows that come from other peoples, from social interaction. So I don't feel those provocations, those lesions, because I have built this defense, this armor. So um, in, in the, the edifice of, uh, uh, of uh, um, sympathy, how the ideal of apatheia plays, so is this a, a threshold that somehow creates a, a gap or how negotiable is that inside, outside? Because the normative, the normative side of uh, uh, stoic ethics it seems to me is incredibly aggressive and invites to this, to this defense against the world, against uh, at least the human world. So this is the question for you, and um, the question triggered by um, your Aristotle, uh, Sarah, I was really very taken by your uh, demonstration. Um, if I may, uh, it seems to me that distinction between Zoe and Bios uh, that you know, uh, we, we, we take from Agamben, actually Agamben is at the end of, of a chain of intertextual echoes that are not worked through with all due respect for <laughs> the great Giorgio, but there is, <laughs> I mean, there is Arendt, it's mm. Hannah Arendt, is the difference between Zoe and Bios Politikos, yeah. and if we look at this one passage that would be the octoritas for, uh, in, in this way of thinking, politics one, mm. actually is the difference between to live and to live well, and it's, you know, Zen and Eut Zen. So the, you don't even have the dichotomy between uh, Zoe and Bios. So it's, I think, it's, but it's a hang for you. Your, uh, your d demonstration on the contrary, I found wonderful. Um, and I have a, a sort of complementary question. How about thinking that for Aristotle, even the virtues are shared? And when I say even the virtues, I would say I'm still thinking about the emotions because after all, the intersection between virtues and emotions is so strong. The overlap is so strong. Um, and the very definition of the virtues, the virtues is the ability of producing and preserving good for ourselves and for others. There is a dynamis ewergike in the virtues. So intrinsically virtues are interactive. This is what I, I think. You can't imagine 
an excellent human being living by himself or herself, if ever Aristotle would think in a gender neutral manner. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so thank you so much, Julie. I mean, that's a really important point, and I think it, again, goes to the kind of paradox um, at the heart of the Stoics. On the one hand, you have this open affectability and a skin that's incredibly porous, and on the other hand, as you say, this kind of, you know, this shell. Um, and I think it goes back to this question of, of this vertical axis where you have a differential distribution of mind that's nevertheless, you know, increasingly going up the scale towards God. And, of course, the challenge for the human uh, and the adult human in Stoicism is that we contain in ourselves all of those layers so that sort of, you know, um, ontogenically we begin as plants and then we become animals and then, you know, we, we have our oikiosis and we, you know, we're increasingly rational and then we're rational human beings and we should be a sage. But the problem is, is that we can't imagine the coexistence of all of these forms of susceptibility to the, you know, the kind of active principle of the cosmos or the, the kind of coexistence of all of these different forms of realism of a form of life because we are all these forms of life. We're plant, we're animal, we're, we're reason. And so the, the move, the kind of ascendancy towards apatheia is necessarily predicated on the denial of all of these other modes of existence. And to really, and be precisely because they're, I think they're so vivid and um, they are modes of access to this active principle that in a way the choice has to be made all the more, you know, um, in this totalitarian way, that we must check, you know, that, that the, the kind of question of assent is precisely that point of taking everything of, of, of kind of openness and sort of checking it to open up the space of the sage and cosmopolitanism. But I would just say, I mean, I think the challenge is, is we often want to think about Epicureanism as the alternative, as the sort of, you know, the, the, the skin that's open. And in fact, but, I mean, the challenge of Epicureanism is there's a, you know, the ataraxia is a variant of that as well. I mean, there are, there are similarities and convergences between Stoicism and Epicureanism as much as there are divergences. Um, and that, you know, in, in Epicureanism, the idea that, um, you know, the, the contingencies of the world are such that the human ethical life has to be carved out of a world that's indifferent creates the same notion sometimes of this, you know, this notion of a citadel, you know, I mean, Foucault picks up on. And so I would just say it's, there, I think within Stoicism, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I love Epicureanism, and I, you know, I'm more sympathetic to it, but I found it incredibly productive to think through Stoicism's complexities along, and, and to think through them alongside Epicureanism as kind of equally illuminating and equally complex. Well, I, Julia, thank you very much. And uh, all I very briefly would say is, uh, uh, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right that that, uh, that that for Aristotle the virtues are shared. I mean, when we think about the passage in the <clears throat> a passage in the Politics where he says, you know, we form poles not not simply to share life, but for the sake of noble deeds, right? There, I think that that question that I was hoping to pose, well, well, who owns the deeds? I think is 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 uh, I'm hoping there to open up this point that that the the deeds are, are in a sense they have to be owned by the city that they, they don't belong to the individual insofar as the individual can't simply be considered to be the agent of noble deeds so so they're they're produced within the the conglomerate that is created by the sharing of life for the sake of this production of noble deeds. And so, so then the, the question, I think, becomes a methodological question of, of what is the, the object of analysis in a political theory or in an ethics. And, and so uh, what, what I hope is, is obvious is, is not that, that I, I think that, that Aristotle's politics is a uh, a, a good idea for us, but rather that that discerning the methodology of his political theory requires us to identify a mode of analysis of collective living that that could extend well beyond what he would call a political life. So so that that there 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 is a, a sort of again a, a methodological decision that extends much further than Aristotle himself uses, uh, but that we could use. Uh, 
I'm very sorry to kind of cut off any further responses because I'm sure we could go on for some time. Can I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists and speakers for a wonderful discussion on wonderful papers? Thank you. Thank you.